College of Art Design for our Masters. Uh, for my undergrad, I trained as an illustrator, and I've been watercoloring for several years now. Um, I'm Becky Goldberg. Uh, both of us graduated with a master's degree in sequential art. We both do watercolor comics and a lot of watercolor art in general. Uh, both of us have very different approaches to watercolor, so if one contradicts the other, it doesn't mean the other person's method is wrong. It just means the person contradicting handles it differently and thought it might be useful information for you guys. Um, I got my undergrad at the University of New Orleans, and it's actually a BS. My boyfriend always wants to argue with me. <laughs> oh yeah? <laughs> yep, this film to colleges that don't give BFAs. Um, but it's BS in fine art. Um, my specialty there was hypermedia, which is digital graphics and printmaking. But I did a lot of watercolor. It's always funny what you end up doing professionally. Uh, my focus is kids media, and Heidi's is more teen oriented. And we're just waiting on the AV guy to come hook us up. <laughs> So you guys don't have to look at her background of Tom Hiddleston. Always better. Wearing a <laughs> with, with his hair freshly done. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Not, nothing's wrong with that if you like Tom Hiddleston. If your heart beats for T. Hiddles. If it goes dope, dope. <laughs> Which is a Korean watercolor brand. It's also surprisingly good and very cheap. 
Um, am I missing anything that's in um, the affordable category? Yeah, so that's good. This this is uh, a Yarka brand, and it was I think about fifty dollars for a palette that has many colors that just popped out. Um, what is this? Twenty four color palette. So that's actually not bad at all. They're in pans rather than tubes, and I actually used my poor um, Van Dyke brown, but this is this palette. So it's about fifty to sixty dollar palette, and it gives you pretty much every color you'll need to start out with. Maybe a few more to supplement. Um, so I found it to be pretty good. So for those of us who are starting out, you can buy your watercolors many ways, but two of the most common ways are pans and tubes. And um, I'm sure everybody knows what a tube of watercolor might look like in in the wild. But a pan is basically just dried watercolors. Uh, some people will fill empty pans, which are just like little tiny chiclet sized containers. Yeah, um, like this. They'll fill it with tube watercolor and let it dry. That's what I do. It works, but it will behave differently than watercolor straight out of the tube. In fact, everything in this palette is something from a tube that I've just squirted on here and let dry. Um, I find this easier to reconstitute it than try to work wax, but yeah. we'll talk about that more later. My, my paints always end up oversaturated when I work from a wet tube. Um, and as you can see, there's a couple of examples of what I was just talking about, where we will buy separate materials and then split. I centered this neutral tint and I centered this cherry red. And I think some of the other colors in here, you yeah, can see while I was <laughs> while you were visiting. Um, we both have very different watercolor collections. We both like very different types of colors, so it works out really well, I think, because I'll have things she would not have bought in a store but ends up really liking, and vice versa. Usually if I want saturated watercolors, I talk to Heidi, because while I, I like pastel beauty, she likes deep blue. Um, and then the other thing that people have trouble with is the fact
but that was me not being familiar with the paper. All right, we have, we have images, images now. now. Um, also, if you guys have questions, just please raise your hand and we will try our best to answer this. Um, but yeah, here's, you know, the materials you need. You're like, oh my goodness, I go to the store, they've got a million things to look at it. And what brushes do I want? What, what all do I need besides just the paper? So we're gonna to try to go through all of that. And keep in mind that when you go to the art supply store, you never have to buy everything all at once. There's a lot of things that you have at home that make great substitutes. Like, um, like you don't really need a palette. If, if you have like, uh, Dixie cups or um, little the medicine caps that come with that you can use that until you buy a palette. And you don't have to have the art store tools to be able to do it. So yeah, we already talked about these papers already. Um, just keep in mind that generally uh, watercolor paper is going to be it's called a hundred and forty pound paper. Um, that's that's like the starting point for what you want to paint on. Anything lower than that is going to work on you, even if you stretch it. Uh, things higher than that are great, they're fun to paint on, but they tend to be more expensive and um, you may have difficulty finding them in the sizes you want. Yeah. Um, I will tell, if, if anyone's curious, the 140 pound is how much it weighs when they press out like one, like an amount of it, it's like a cubic amount. And so your paper waste is always, that's what's always up. Um, it doesn't weigh 140 pounds once they cut it. It's like a set number of sheets. It would weigh this much. But I forgot the number of sheets, so I'm a terrible artist. <laughs> it's science. Well, it oh, I stopped. Um, there's also other ma the materials you can use to paint watercolor on. Um, illustration board, again, it comes with hot press and cold press. Uh, it's a lot more expensive. It tends to be very thick. You don't have to stretch it. It's self-supporting. Um, many times I've gotten matte board and I've used Super 77 to paste on thinner paper if I wanted to. Aren't your little gouache paintings at your table painted yep. for that one? Yep. Mm -hmm. Gouache is like a paper. Don't worry, I'm sparkling today. Um, then we talked a little bit about our paints. Uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, Whole Wine, Yorka, Soho, Windsor Newton, Shinhan, Sennelaire, Blick. Da Vinci, Marie's. Marie's is like a little Chinese brand. Um, it's pretty good. The colors are very saturated. Yeah. Um, and then there's also ones I've used that are they're called honey based paints, where they use honey as a binder instead of. It's usually a super low space. Um, they, when they use gum bases, that's in really cheap watercolors, yeah. and that's why they degrade so quick. Is they dry up. Mm -hmm. uh, a honey-based watercolor is not ever going to dry up. They are able to reconstitute pigments from a hundred years ago and paint with those because it's just perfectly archival. Mm -hmm. Those tend to be a little bit more expensive, though. You just have to think, though, a tube of watercolor paint that you know might be yay, yay tall. Um, it might cost twenty dollars to buy now, but no, you're gonna get small. No. So some of the, the honey ones are oh, for, for well. rare honeys for colors. Um, it's true. A lot of brands will have three different stages of price. And series one, series two, series three. Series one being the cheapest, most commonly available pigments. They tend to be earth tones or um, uh, commonly available earth based pigments. Uh, the most series three can be made from things like brown lapis lazuli. Yeah. And um, but that, that tube of paint is going to last you a very long time. Uh, Especially if you're paint. sharing with friends, you have twice the palette. Are you going to question? Yeah, I was wondering, I know with acrylics you can uh, mix and different colors. Can oh, you do the same with Oh, definitely. You can, um, you can both mix straight out of the tube. I wouldn't recommend unless you know exactly what color you're going for and you mix those two together. Most people will mix it after it's been mixed uh, in a palette cup. But yeah, if most good colors for like a harmonious watercolor painting are mixed colors, they're not straight from the palette because that would be too intense and it would be very disjointed. Um, I even actually have a slide later on that shows mixing some colors, so we'll get there. Um, um, there's also these things called liquid watercolors, and they come in those little bottles you can see on the right. They kind of um, look like medicine droppers. They have an eyedropper in yeah. there. They're extremely concentrated. They are not. Like, and here's like. The number one thing you should remember about watercolors, they're not light, light safe. Do not leave them out in the sun. The 
Concentrated liquid watercolors are extremely hot and light safe. They're great if you're like me, where you paint something and then you scan it and you send that to the person who purchased it. Um, but they're not good if you wanted to paint something that someone would be displaying in their home. Yeah. Um, and the the liquid ink watercolors actually do act a little bit more like inks for when you put them down. So oh, I take yeah. them back up. Because yeah. they stain the paper because yeah. they're synthetic dyes, they're not pigments. Right. I, I will use these if I want to go really dark and do like some very dark blacks in a picture because I can just put them down first and they'll stay right there. Oh, there. The concentrated watercolors are, you taught me this trick, they are phenomenal for night skies. You mix four colors like um, a purple, a yellow, a blue, and a red together in like a little container and you shake it up. When you paint it, they're going to somewhat separate on the paper so you have like this beautiful mottled sky effect and you can layer it to get a more intense sky. We didn't bring them with us because they're glass bottles. Yeah, they're a little bit fragile. Yeah. Um, then once you decide what watercolors you want to buy, we recommend always making test swatches. Uh, I have a swatch book. I, I, I personally don't necessarily recommend moleskin watercolor paper or moleskin notebooks as like your watercolor medium, whatever, painting paper of choice because they're expensive and they're cheaper alternatives. But if you're going on a trip or you want to keep a swatch book or you like to paint on the go, they're, they're really pretty good for that. And it's handy to be able to pull out this uh, flip notebook and reference what colors, what they look like when they've been applied straight from the tube, when they've been allowed to dry, when they've been diluted. Because a lot of colors will change drastically. For me, I actually have a drawing of this pan up on my wall and then I have each one marked. And like then, a map? Yeah, and then labeled as to what it is. And it's, it's just taped up to my wall. It's always there. Um, watercolor pencils. It's kind of relates to watercolors. Uh, when I first picked up watercolor pencils, I picked up the Prismacolor mm. ones, and I thought I couldn't use watercolor pencils whatsoever. Crayola ones, which were terrible. Mm -hmm. So as much as Prismacolor actually makes good other stuff, the watercolor pencils are crap. They have a lot of color. If you are interested in using watercolor pencils, they can be a great medium. They're very affordable. Uh, they're fairly affordable. They last a long time. We both recommend Dural Mint's Intense watercolor pencils. They're very pigmented. They're very watery. Uh, they release the color when you add water. Yeah, that's actually what that center one is. is those are the some of the Dural Mint Intense ones. They're beautiful. They're bright. They're vibrant. Um, and you can just use like a. a you buy these in our store, it's a like empty plastic brush that has uh, a brush tip and just fill it with water and you can use them on the go. And brushes. This can be scary because you see nice watercolor brushes and you're like, why does this brush cost almost $90? And and there's some that are worth, I, I have no $90 brushes, okay? I've got three cats and they chew my brushes, so I don't have nice things. But you don't need to have the nicest either. There's some excellent synthetics, there's some really good mixes. Most good watercolor brushes are going to be made out of red sable or squirrel hair. Um, the white goat bristle brushes, those are good if you want to like scrub out a color that you misapplied, but they're not good for applying color. In watercolor, they're great for acrylic though. Um, I've actually gone to using what's called a synthetic sable or a sable blend. Uh, uh, using the Neptunes? I don't I use, there are of, I use a lot of the blick ones are in there. Those are my actual brushes I use all the time. Um, and they're actually very nice. They still come to a very nice point. Um, and they cost me anywhere between 2 to $10 for a brush, which is really, really to the cheap for a brush. Honestly, you don't need that many sizes of brushes. Um, yeah, this is, this is, these are mostly the ones I don't use. Um, I went to get this because I have a mixture of brushes. So. These would be the stiff short bristles. These are like the goat's hair or pig bristle brushes, and I use those as scrubbers. Um, this, this golden color, it's a synthetic. It's a cheap synthetic, which is fine for applying um, like washes of color. Uh, these chewed on looking brushes where it's all kind of wrecked and frayed. These were natural fibers. Um, my cat chewed on them. Another caveat about using natural fibers is that during the winter in Tennessee, moths will, uh, if you don't put them away, you'll find a moth infestation. That's really gross. Um, I think, I'm where? I do, they were stable hair before the cat chewed on them. But that was, they still are. This one? 
Yeah, it's a good synthetic. I just don't use it. Yeah. And then there's also like um, you can and people do paint with like Sumi style or Chinese style brushes. Um, I I just don't, not for any particular reason. Um, and each brush with a different type of hair is going to have a different property. Um, she talked about the goat hair being very stiff. Uh, squirrel hair and like the the Sumi E brushes are very. Uh, Soft and but they loose. have a good a good natural brush will be soft and loose, but it will have something called a belly. And the belly is so a brush makes like a teardrop shape, right? It's the bottom of the teardrop that holds your water and holds your pigment when you're painting. Um, if you take care of your brushes, and it's not it's really not that hard. Your brush can last for twenty some odd years if you don't have cats and moths. Um, if you have cats, they'll last three years. Um, the way to take care of a natural brush is they sell, there's a brush soap, but you can also use baby shampoo to or, just kind of clean them out and then you condition them with normal people hair conditioner. And you should condition your brushes because just like people hair, um, those fibers do get, they get brittle from overuse, they get brittle from just rough treatment or being wet and dry and wet and dry or like cold weather will wreck them. You can also use Dawn dish soap. Uh, Dawn dish soap is amazing. Just remember to condition it after. Yeah, it will, it will strip it. it. So if you left with Dawn, if you left pigments in, it'll usually get all the pigments out. And even even if you think a brush is wrecked, sometimes giving it repeated washings and conditionings will um, bring it back to its former life. Yeah. If it's three dollar brush, don't bother. No, just no, I'm not because, suggesting yeah. you salvage three dollar brushes if you don't want to. I'm saying if someone gave you a twenty dollar brush as a present, or if you invested in one. It is definitely worth your time and effort to take care of it. Yeah. Um, speaking of like the, I said that the the squirrel hair is very soft. My favorite is the sable because it's between the two. It's actually got a, a medium hardness, um, and it's very springy. So when you press down and pull up, it just springs right yeah. back into shape. And, and you want that? Right if you don't take care of your brushes, they'll get. I I think of them as like mushy or soppy. It's like trying to paint with a mop. Um, a lot of people's disgruntledness with watercolor comes from bad paper, bad pigments, bad brushes. Um, and that's that's a real killer. But then there's like that zen joy of painting when you've got like a brush with just the right snap and pulls those lines for you. So I know we've, we've told you all like, oh, well, these are like good materials to get. Honestly, you can get a good set of brushes, watercolors, and paper and still be under $100. So, oh yeah, I think I've so, written posts about how to do that. She too. has some posts on her blog, which is natosoup.blogspot.com. I believe it's under the resources on the, the handout, um, where she goes through and we, we talk about art materials for under $100. And to, to rewind a lot, I just remembered, I actually use a Sakura Koi set. It's just a little 12 color set. It's not perfect, but it's really good and it's under 20 bucks and you can just buy two brushes. I would recommend uh, purchasing round. They're called rounds. They're the ones that look like a teardrop in a size. They come in sizes, a size four and a size six would probably be your most versatile sizes. And that's a really good way to get started for under $30. Um, the, the shapes of watercolor brushes are round, which is the teardrop one over that you see on the left. Um, Filbert, which is that fan shape, the actual fan one, um, and then flat. I honestly think you can get probably a number 10 flat, which is usually about yay wide, um, probably a number eight round and a number two round, and those will be all the brushes you'll need to start out with. Um, and okay. as you as you paint and you think about what you're painting, like if you paint a lot of small things or detailed things, like I do my comics in watercolor, I have a bunch of zero, double zeros, zeros, ones, twos, and threes because I'm painting tiny faces. And the smaller the number, the smaller the tip. That's right. All right. So we've covered most of the materials. But does anyone have any questions on them before we move on to a little bit about color theory? Yeah. All right. Color theory. Um, with paints, generally it's been taught that red, yellow, and blue are your primary colors. That you can use those three colors to mix pretty much anything. And if you have black, you can mix anything. Um, this is true to some extent, but uh, generally you're going to need a, a warm blue and a cool blue, or more of a cyan color. And because there's just certain oh, colors you can't mix with just the three basic yeah. primaries. And you'll want a warm red and a cool red, or more of a magenta, a slightly magenta a tint, red and, and a slightly orange, orange one. 
And yellows, they do have different ones. Um, getting, I would actually say getting yellow ochre and then a lemon yellow are going to be what you need. Yellow ochre is... And see, I would say three yellows. I would go for a, yeah, a bright yellowish green yellow. I would get a warmer sun... Oh, I could just yeah, white, right? They're a, little bit, they're a little bit dirty, but... This color is yellow ochre, so yeah. it's a slightly tan yellow. I always yellow. recommend that. It's great for mixing um, a caucasian, yeah, dirty mustard, a caucasian yeah. skin tone. You use that with like a little bit of this, uh, this is a, a more orangey red. It's what, like Scarlet Lake? Mm, I'm not sure. I'm and that's right. your, your basic caucasian skin tone. Um, and then having either like cadmium yellow or um, a lemon yellow is a very bright and vibrant yellow, which I almost use exclusively for mixing because I don't like it that much. Um, if you do a lot of flower paint, it opens up a lot though. Um, and then you also probably want to get a green. Uh, even, even Two greens. You want a yellow green and a blue green. Uh, even mixing a nice blue and a nice yellow, you're still not going to get quite as nice of a green as you can get um, with, with a pure green. Um, we say a good set of 12 colors is really what you need to start with, and everyone's going to tell you a different set. My personal favorite, I'm going to go with paint gray instead of black, it's a slightly cooler black. I like Van Dyke brown, it's a warm black. And I use that for mixing, yeah. um, like, Asian or African American. Yeah. Tones. It's a great color. Yeah. It's a very um, warm, rich brown. And depending on which brown, which brand you get, Van Dyke brown can range from yellow to very red, so just be aware of that. Um, yellow ochre is a very consistent color throughout it's brands. It's pretty much always yeah. mustardy. <laughs> yeah. Um, burnt sienna is a reddish brown. Um, and then burnt umber is a very dark brown. You can use burnt umber or you can use Van Dyke brown. Um, a warm and cool red is cadmium. Um, reds, they have both warm and cool hues. Oh, wow. And speaking of, so uh, something you guys really need to keep, keep in mind is cadmium red. If you're using nice watercolors, it has cadmium in it. That's why it's cadmium red. It's extremely toxic. Don't put your brushes in your mouth. Don't drink from your water cup if you can help it. And I, we have a lot of artist friends who, whoops, yeah, they do because they use mugs instead of cup, like special cups. Uh, don't chew on your brushes. Don't don't put the paints in your mouth, please. Don't put the paints on your skin if you can help it. Or around animals. Yeah. Oh man, chasing my cats lick the watercolor palettes for the sugar or something. Um, yeah. The cats. If you have cats, I use a peanut butter jar with the lid next to it. So if they see them coming, it yeah. put them real on real fast. Um, also, again, a warm and a cool blue. Uh, Cerulean blue can be good, but a lot of times it's mixed with the white in it. Um, right, so it won't mix properly and it won't apply. If yeah. it's great, it's great for size, but it's not a pure pigment. Yeah. They usually put like a a white chalk in it. Oh, this one's stuck in there, but it's this blue right here, so it's the slightly lighter blue. Um, and then like a sap, sap green, which is a very yellow green, or um, I there's a green gold color. And that's okay. Yeah, um, she's just getting over the blue by the house. Sorry. No, I'm worried for you. This is just the way very Too hot. Very I'm so sorry. Um, well, there's a, a, a like bamboo green or a uh, green gold color. Those are very nice as well. Um, and then you can use lamb black. I personally prefer never to I actually use a carbon black yeah. and uh, a Venero black, which is more of a brown black. And then if you have any you think are essential. I always have an indigo. I always have a paint gray. Um, most of the ones, I paint grass and flower stuff a lot because my comic is about tiny people, so they're like grass -like. Um So like a green gold, lots of good greens. And uh, that's where the watercolor pencils are amazing because like when I paint grass, if I'm just painting with watercolors and I'm not patient and I don't let it dry, it looks like a swamp instead of grass. And then um, we're, we're, someone's asking about mixing colors, and this is it: is you can use, uh, you can mix colors, but you can also mix complementary colors to make uh, grays, or just to or just to tone down an yeah. oversaturated color. Right. So um, there is actually like a little sheet I did where I I made it, or I used a pure pigment like a pure green, and then I mixed a green using um, a blue and yellow. So you can kind of see the difference. the blue and yellow is more gray. But there are separation effects you will get when you mix that you won't get otherwise. Um, <coughs> sorry. 
and um, the same thing with, with any of the colors. And then over on the right, you can use opposites to shade. So it's it's a orangey burnt sienna, and then I use some blues to shade with, and that definitely, um, I think it, it brings out a lot more vibrancy in it because you can see a little bit of these colors rather than using like the flat black to shade. Yeah. Well, I when I said I had a black, I, I didn't mean to shade. I meant for like tires yeah. and like things that are black, like that speaker over there. Yeah. Oh, um, so she and I handle our color theory a little bit differently. For my convention watercolors, which you can see in the artist alley, um, I keep them very simple because I sell them at very low prices. Um, so I don't worry too much about complementary colors in terms of shading, but I might use complementary colors in terms of background, and unfortunately, the projector destroys watercolors. <laughs> Woo! Um, and then I lost my train of thought because of that. But in general, when I'm painting more serious things, I will use a complementary color, and then I will do a, um, another shade, especially for like night scenes, where it's like indigo paint, gray and maybe a purple, very light washes of that. Um, and then I tend to go through and once I get to uh, doing shadows, I'll use a very similar color for all of the shadows together. Uh, yeah, because it unifies, it unifies the, the piece. Right. Um, the That's one what I was saying. The left, I use pretty much red for all the shadows, or red and a burnt umber. Um, and then the one on the right, I use a violet for all the shadows, and it just pulls everything together. Any questions on color before we get to some of the, the demo technique stuff? Or any questions in general? And if it's if it's like too too much at one time, you can always uh, send us emails or you can um, send us an ask on Tumblr and we'd be happy to explain and we'd be happy to do demonstrations for you that way too. I know it's kind of like an info dump. <laughs> All right. You want to start? Yeah, let's, let's go. I'm going to go fix the camera. Okay. Right, if you guys want to stand up and come closer, um, we'll, we'll try to work on you guys having this. Actually, I'm just going to move the thing. I'll put it up there. Actually, I think that might work better. Stretching watercolor paper, you have to do that before you uh, can paint on it. Um, just because the paper actually has a gelatinous. It's got a yeah. gel, like a gelatin sizing. Mm -hmm. Like what makes your jello be jello. Yeah. Same thing. And the first time you put water on it, it dissolves. And that's why a lot of watercolor paper is wiggly, is the papers have, the fibers have stretched unevenly. So, um, stretching it releases that first layer of gelatin and mm -hmm. causes it to stay flat earth. It's still going to work with buckle just a little bit just because that's the paper's nature. But it certainly helps a lot. Dude, that would be great. Do you care if I stand so on the chair? Was, um, oh, I'm just going to stand on the stage. Um, but, and then I've got like, a, a, our book that talks even more in depth about all this. She talks some about it on her blog. So we've got all kinds of stuff. You guys can come bother us. Those are, yeah, please take one. Um, these are from my Tumblr, but um, it's just because I didn't bring my blog postcards. My blog is not as a Tumblr, I mean, at, at Blogspot, but I filter a lot of it over to Tumblr anyway. So um, when I'm stretching watercolor paper, I use this corrugated plastic. I used to use a wood board, but I didn't like the results. This is extremely light, it's extremely cheap. Don't buy it in an art supply store. They want $20 for it. No, go to like Home Depot or um, any home and garden store should have it. It's like corrugated signboard. After election season, go ask your neighbors <laughs> if they care. Most of them won't. They'll be happy not to have to throw it away. Um, I also use blue painter's tape. There is um, gummed watercolor tape. I've tried using it. It's terrible. I looked up online to see if I was just an idiot. Apparently, no. Most people who use it then trim that ruined paper off of uh, where the tape was. So no, I'm not an idiot. It's just overly packed. And um, these are some examples of already stretched watercolors. 
so um, what I don't have that I like to have is a squirt bottle and Viva paper towels. And I say Viva because- I have pretty nice paper towels in there already. You do yeah. in here? Yeah. Awesome. Because Viva doesn't have a, um, a texture to it, so it's not gonna leave a texture on your paper. Like, see how this has a texture? But like any paper towels are good to have handy when you're painting. So when I'm stretching, let's, do you have a pencil real handy? Does anybody have a Probably. pencil real handy? Here's my silver bag wherever it wound up. Oh. I have I have colored pens and regular pens. I just want to mark back in front for demonstration purposes. So let's say this is the back and this is the front. And papers do have a back and a front um, the in the pad or on the the block, the side that's up is of course the front. Um, it's important to keep that in mind because with cheaper papers, it will not behave the same way. Um, so I stretch my back first. And I usually use like a, a mop brush, but this is fine, a flat is fine too. That's what I use that flat for a yeah. lot. Well, the, with the mop, I can get more water on the paper quicker. Yeah. I have a, a size 30 flat that I'll use for. So I, sat I saturate the back and I let it kind of soak in before I dab off the excess water. And what I usually do is I just roll the whole roll of paper towels over it, like a paper towel steamroller. <laughs> and something that's really handy to have if you're into watercolor <coughs> is um, like bulldog clips, because I will usually clip, like let's say this is a full size piece, right? I will clip it down so that the paper is pinched in addition to the tape, and that will help keep it from uh, pulling as it dries. And cheap paper, even if you stretch it, will um, has a tendency to buckle sometimes. Like 90 pound paper will buckle no matter what. Okay, so here's a trick. When you're applying your tape, you apply it to your skin. Don't apply it to the hairy side, if you're like me. <laughs> apply it to the like soft baby side, because gross fact, um, the skin cells will make the tape just a little less tacky so it won't pull up your paper. Mm -hmm. Oh shoot, you can also, I also, um, sorry, I also wet it down. You can also use your jeans if you don't mind getting your jeans It's wet. true, but if you have cats, the it's just gonna like not be tacky at all. I rub out any air bubbles and then I wipe it off. And the reason you want to wet the tape is so the tape and the paper dry together and that'll keep, it should keep it from pulling. Um, sometimes it'll bubble anyway and just press it back down. <laughs> and Heidi and I are both cheater, cheater, cheaters and that um, we have a little secret trick. We, when we're doing big line art pieces, instead of sketching it on the watercolor paper directly and erasing and inking, um, we will do our sketch uh, either digitally or on another piece of paper, we'll scan it, we'll do some Photoshop magic that I describe on my blog where you uh, turn it to grayscale and you drop everything but your, your strongest values leaving your line art and we'll um, go to, what is it, mode, duotone, yep. and we have non-photo blue as a preset. And I have all that information on my blog, if you want to look it up. And we print it out like that. And when you're stretching your watercolors, the water reactivates the pigments in your printer ink. And um, so it washes away. So if you pencil it before you wash it, it looks like you did this really detailed line art. Like, just magic. Like, I'm just so good. I never make any mistakes, right? And you can paint over that. The other thing you can do is, once you've drawn something, flip it over and use like a graphite stick. You can buy them. Oh yeah, um, a, a, a graphite transfer. Yeah, um, I actually recommend not getting the graphite transfer paper because it's got like a wax in it. And just it's also get a, overpriced. Yeah, just get a graphite stick, rub it on the back, flip back over and just trace over again. Um, that's actually... I'm gonna use your paints. Okay. Um, I was gonna switch you for the bag to white bag. Oh yeah, this one? Yes. Oh. Should I move so you can, I can get you better? Sure. Well, I'm getting Why the back. you feel necessary? I'm getting like the back of you and then I'm not getting the whole. I can sit too. And that's how I did like these is with that graphite transfer. So you can see that it's got 
it's not perfect, um, but I'm going to go over it with a colored pencil at the end to um, tighten it up because it is a line drawing. And sometimes the pads will pull up. Yep. You can just use your painter's tape to tape the edges. Yeah. Um, when I stretch these, because I did stretch these, I literally just put uh, a large brush, put water over it, wipe it all off. Um, because they're bound on two sides, they wrinkle a little bit less, and you don't have to do quite as much with them. Will they not I'm curl lazy. if you do it that way? Um, they will curl uh, still a little bit. Yeah, when the humidity gets high, I, I mean, it's going. they're going to be just things that you can't control. Mm -hmm. um, when the humidity is high, it's not a good time to paint because your paint will dry really, really, really slow. Um, if it's too dry outside, they'll dry too fast, and your paper will get really wrinkly because the sizing didn't dissolve properly. If it's too cold, like it was in Nashville this winter, I couldn't paint at all because my paints weren't behaving in any way that I could predict. Um, it's unfortunate. Uh, experience will help you out. I don't have a hard and fast guide for that. Yeah. They're just nice. It's like you need like, a, it's not a painting yeah, you need like a humidifier and a dehumidifier. And? <laughs> so I'm gonna go over a basic wash which is really pretty simple. And I'm gonna be tacky and use the, the, the blue tape as like a mini palette to make sure the pigment gets distributed the way I want it. Oh, that's like super. It is very blue. I don't want that color. I'm not familiar with our palette anymore. That's also very blue. I want a very blue because it's a night scene and I'm just doing, I'm just doing a little wash to uh, tone all of it so it looks like it belongs together. If that makes sense. So it's not like bright pink skin with fireflies and like, I don't know, bright green dress with like a black background, which can look really cool. And you see that kind of technique in manga a lot, but it's not what I'm going for. And if your wash is too saturated, you can just pour water into it to lighten it up a bit. And usually what I would do is I went and bought like a bunch of the art alternatives brand watercolor palettes because they're really cheap and they work fine and they have like 12 wells which is usually all I need for a small painting. Okay so the reason I apply a wash like that first is because it's going to um, help me tie the whole thing together as I'm painting it. Like I said so it's not bright pink skin, bright green dress, dark brown hair and then black background. It's more um, her skin will have like a little bit of that blue cast to it ahead of time. Alright. Um, Are you going to do the, do you need the one that has oh, it's the actually, strokes? Yeah. Um, and then what I'm going to explain to you guys is there's, this is generally, um, there's considered four techniques for putting watercolor on a piece of paper. And what it is, it depends on whether your paper is wet or dry and whether you're using wet or dry paint. Um, by wet paint or dry paint, it's always going to be wet because it's a liquid. How, it's just how, how wet, wet your, brush, yeah. your brush is. Um, um, and something I recommend is when you're painting, when you first oh, start painting awesome. for the session, you put a drop of water in each one of your wells to get your paints activated. Because mm -hmm. it'll, it'll get the pigments already started, so you'll have pretty even pigments the whole time. You're not going to have to scrub as hard to yeah. get them. Apparently this ink was also not water safe, which you'll need to... That's something you need to know ahead of time. All right. Um, wet on wet means that I'm taking paint that's um, very wet, very watered down. I'm going to have to use that. And putting it on. That's going to cause this bleeding effect where you're not going to have solid edges and it's going to spread out throughout a lot of the water. Um, if I'm totally like that, it'll drip the whole way down. Um, and I'll tear the sheet off and pass it around so you guys can look. Dry paint on wet, I pretty much never use. You can also grab from mine. Um, so when I say dry paint, the um, oranges should be dry. Yeah, it just means that it's very thick and concentrated. And if you put it dry on dry, you get dry brush. But um, it still does most of the wet on wet stuff. It's just a little more detailed, but it still doesn't have a hard yeah. edge. So it can so be it's really be useful. very fuzzy, but it's still going to be. Um, Intense and dark like that. Useful for shadows. Um, the other thing I do a lot with wet and wet is if I've already got wet paint down on a palette, I'll take or on a paper, I'll take a totally different color that will be wet, and I'll work it right into it. And you can get some really cool modeling effects with that. Um, the two colors are going to separate a little bit, and they're going to mix a lot. So you're not going to get 
like just a pure purple and a pure blue, you're going to get a lot more variation gradation. Um, that's actually how I do a lot of my work. Um, if the paper is dry and you put wet paint down, you're going to get some very hard edges, um, but you can do a lot of stuff, again, with the inner part of it using wet on wet. So you get the blue paint down. And I really recommend having two uh, water cups, a dirty and a clean, just for like time and space purposes. We only have one. Yeah. Do as we say, don't do as we do in that instance. Um, and having the hard outline, but having something wet, wet inside allows you to make modeling inside. And it's going to be very controlled because yeah. it's not going to push past it where, go past where it's already wet. And something else that I did, but I didn't mention, is if you don't like how something looks, you can, um, if it's still wet, you can pick it up with like a paper towel. Huh. Erase! <laughs> wow. Um, and then dry dry is generally, you use a small brush for this, and it's generally finishing lines. So you'll take your, your nice dry paint. Like eyelashes, yeah. eyebrows. And it gives you almost a dry brush effect. If your paint is too dry, that should be a little bit wetter than that. Um, but it's how you get some nice lines um, and strokes with very solid colors. This is for like detailing in, um, like if I was just doing a pupil in an eye, or just you know like whiskers on a cat or something, um, you would use dry paint on a dry. And watercolors do take a long time to dry. There's a lot of times where after I do a wash, I set it down. Mm -hmm. I don't come back do for four hours. And that's why I, when I'm painting, I do four paintings at a time because I am very impatient. And. Um, I also just have a heavy workload, and I tend to get a lot of work in watercolor, so it's, it helps me manage the, the unfortunate effect that watercolors take a while with the fact that I need to pump them out. And with watercolors, because this has a dry edge, if I wanted to go in and blend, all I do is just take some regular water and go in and push. It's going to leave these edges, they're called wet edges if you ever use Photoshop, but it's going to leave like a line that designates this at point the paint dried and then I picked it back up again and then I'll leave another line. And that's good if you want to um, kind of like blend something out. Mm -hmm. um, generally that's why I work light to dark is so I don't get those lines. You can start light and then just pull in more darks later. And also if you don't like, and they may have dried too much, if you don't like some of your hard lines, you want to soften them up because the pigment is so concentrated, you can apply water or another color even afterwards and kind of rework it. So I guess that means it's time for you guys to play around. We have some watercolor paper for you. And unfortunately, I think we lost the side. Oh, no. OK. All right. So the smoother side is your back. The rougher, a little bit more textured side is your front. This is just a very basic um, kind of cheap watercolor paper. It's a Canson Biggie pad, which is fine if um, you're starting out or if you do like a specific kind of illustration or you use color pencils a lot or you want um, a little bit of a cold press surface but not too much it is a paper you're going to have to stretch um, so feel free to come up we have three mini palettes that um, Heidi dabbed some interesting colors on you're welcome to use our brushes uh, please do not ever for yourself and for us don't leave brushes standing in water that ruins the brushes when you're dipping a brush in water, you really don't want to go past the metal ferrule. That's, that's what holds the brushes in place because it will uh, break down the glue. You also don't ever want to wash your brushes in hot water because it will break down the glue that holds the bristles in the ferrule. I'll let you guys, you can pick it up, pass it around, look at that as you want. Um, it's going to even start showing you what happens when watercolor people buckles because I did yeah. not pre-wash that. Um, and the thing that I actually see people do the most that causes a lot of watercolor problems is overworking your mm -hmm. watercolors. If you ever see little, they're called pills, but it's when the paper starts falling up and you get little dots in it start to form, you just put it down immediately because you've started to overwork the paper and it's No, you've to more dissolve. than yeah, started you've to You've like so far overworked that paper. Um, and that's because it's um, wood pulp, not cotton based. Mm -hmm. Cotton papers tend to be a lot more forgiving it's harder to overwork. And there's another way you can overwork too, where your colors have become muddy and it's hard to distinguish um, like shading variations because like you've applied one wash too many and it's dissolved some of the pigments you've put down beforehand. Um, and that's a problem for me a lot, <laughs> something I'm working on. 
And actually that's a lot of the reason why I use cheaper watercolor paper because then at that point it's never so precious that I can't just be like, okay. Yeah, start well, again. Yeah. <laughs> Other than the time investment. That's gonna be your most expensive, most precious commodity in watercolor is your time. Um, so, ah, thank you. What do you want to do? I can actually, I can actually take over and shut it down. Unless you guys, and if you guys have any questions or any problems, just ask. Yeah. The paper, if you 